All right, you guys. Okay, it's running. Um, I wasn't going to do a video this uh, weekend, but uh, we're at that this point where uh, there's a lot of nervous and negative energy going on, and maybe I've include I've been part of it. Um, so I want to try to. And I'll stop doing these videos once the stock price carries itself. But I want to give people a buttress uh, against what is truly um, thuggish, thuggish behavior. If you were walk driving in New York City, you've seen the news stories, and you're down, going down, uh, I, I don't live there, but Fifth Avenue. And all of a sudden, you're surrounded by these bikes and people get up on top of the car and your elderly mother's with you and they're trying to break in and, and uh, it's not really s stealing in that case to my memory. But point is, these are all people behaving like thugs around you, putting you at risk. This is what's going on in this situation. Now, everyone wants to be polite to the various people. But I, I caution you, I really caution you. These thieves have been practiced at this art of deception. I saw her today at the reception in a glass. It was a bleeding man. Anyway, <laughs> the Rolling Stones, but she was, that woman was practiced at the art of deception. That's what these thieves are. And they set up systems, and they've they've done this for years, and they've done it in more companies. They've had more investors. You're nothing special. You're not special. I'm not special. So then they try every trick. They come onto the message boards as sarcastic, or they come on as your friend. They might even come on, believe it or not, as a lawyer trying to help you. Now, I'm not questioning any one specific uh, person, but um, uh, yeah, I'll lose that thought if I don't say it now. If there were a courageous lawyer out there, they could make themselves uh, as wealthy as Peter Angelos. But lawyers aren't courageous by nature. They're they're very uh, go along, uh, charge by the hour, find your clients, make sure you have a case, uh, get your money up front, just like hookers and therapists, they take their money up front. Um, so they're, they're, you're not gonna get rescued by a uh, courageous lawyer. But um, anyway, what I wanna tell you where where we are and what how you should be doing it and i do not promise this will be a short video so hamster should get off of it not don't even watch it um <clears throat> look i think you're lucky to be in this stock and you're lucky to have hamster and on top of that you're lucky to have a company that is working to fight the shorts and on top of that you're lucky to have a whole crew of wall street professionals that are joining in. And on top of that, you're lucky to have a major investor out of Puerto Rico uh, putting his full weight behind this company. And on top of that, you're lucky to have people in Georgia, in Canada, in uh, other parts of the country making large commitments to this stock. So, and, and I'll add one more thing, the, the whole mood of the marketplace has changed. Um, uh, as money is being lost, people are going to start looking for who to blame. And uh, they're going to blame hedge funds, they're going to blame brokers, but they're going to want to have someone they can take out to the public square and shoot. And it'll be these, these naked short sellers. But nobody understands what's going on. And it's too complicated for a lawyer to understand with all respect to the Belial law firm. They don't get it. Now they get these clever legalese things. Well, I'll grant you that. They can probably out-talk me 
in we've got a 641 problem. You sit, stand with a bunch of lawyers in the middle of a case and they'll walk up to each other. You know, I've been thinking we have a 228 problem here referring to some code in the law and it's it's scintillating conversation but he's good at that what he's not good at is allowing evidence of his own eyes his own ears and what he's witnessing to influence what's a what's entered into the evidence in front of the court or in front of the uh, 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 lawsuit in the lawsuit so he's not going to take into consideration what Ham says about how the trading's going. He's going to ask inane questions like, why is the stock down? We first must determine why the stock's down. Maybe there's a reason the Kramers are selling illegal shares, phantom shares that don't exist. Uh, maybe they're protecting the public because the stock should be down. We have to first prove that. It's inane. It, I'm telling you, it's a dead end. Now, he, as someone said on the call, he might have a good heart, and he might have our interests uh, in mind, but I would also suggest to you, uh, he wrote an article about FUD, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. It's a great article. Apparently, you can go on some of these websites if you're a client, and you know, a customer, like a corporation, and you can block. Uh, certain posters from fear, uncertainty, and doubt. But I, I don't think he sees the irony in his own approach. He creates fear, uncertainty, and doubt in his own approach. Um, let me give you an example. He said, uh, prove what you're saying, then you have a case. Well, he accused, he accused one of the posters of, of making a stupid point well that's a really it's opaque intentionally the dtcc does not report what what they hold intentionally brokerage firms intentionally don't i just put a post on twitter and it's something i've mentioned on these calls before in my opinion the entire a financial system as it relates to Wall Street has become a fractional reserve banking system. Way back in uh, Northern Europe and Italy, uh, when they would move money from, I guess, the Medici's to Florence, um, they would get robbed. So the bank started sending script. And so you'd leave your gold or your other specie in the bank and then the horsemen would ride through the forest with script you'd get to uh, uh, Holland and you would exchange that and the correspondent bank there would honor it well over time bankers noticed that they had a lot of gold in their vaults that no one was claiming it was just sitting there so eventually the banking system became fractional reserve banking and it basically became a 10 to one. Uh, most banks lend out $10 for every $1 they have in their, their uh, coffers. The reason the markets got in trouble in 2008, and I, and I think are gonna get in trouble again, and there's stress tests, so it's hard to prove, and then you then then the what the definition of assets in reserve has changed but i think those ratios get stretched long-term capital management for example went to 100 to 1 that's what they said it might have been worse than that and there may be banks out there that are are in trouble the federal reserve bank which you know is not a, a government institution is highly leveraged and i don't remember it off the top of my head but if bonds go the wrong way that's why they're in there buying bonds they're, they're going to be insolvent it'll it'll bring up a debate on whether the federal reserve can really go insolvent but anyway i'm getting off track point is the banking system for about four or five hundred years has been fractional reserve banking what i think wall street along with lawyers uh, uh this belial law firm it is not a guy that works on, he's not a Wall Street lawyer. These, these 
these guys that are practiced at the art of deception. Um, they learned over time that they that people don't ask for their shares, and so there became a loosey goosey. Let me let me tell you about the system. When I was a broker, and we used to be called brokers. Now we're now if I were there, I'd be called a wealth advisor. But it's just being a broker. But I'll try to run through several things. When you opened an account with me, I had to know my customer. Secondly, um, I didn't get paid a management fee. I got paid on what I invested, what what investments I got you to um, commit to. Now, on that area, Leg Mason was the first company that came up with a trail in mutual funds. So Leg Mason Asset Management, I forget the gentleman right now. Don't get old because you lose names, but I used to know his name by heart. But he, he had a track record that beat the market for five or seven years in a row. And uh, so they we I was recruited by Leg Mason and I knew the top guys well. I went to school uh, where they went. But they, they were the first ones that came out on it with a trail that paid to the broker. But on mutual funds, you had four ways to get people into mutual funds at that time. A shares, B shares, C shares, and D shares. And if, if you wanted to get paid up all up front, you could whack your client for 8.5% in the American funds, or usually in a house fund, it was more like 4.5% but there were days when there were specials when it was higher that you were credited with more. Um, or you could do the either C or D fund where the client didn't pay any commission to get in, but if they got out in the first year, they paid a huge back-end fee and, uh, and so on. But the key is what like Mason designed is a, you as a broker, you got payment on your assets, it wasn't much. It was, it was, I, to my memory, it was 24, 25 basis points. I could be wrong, uh, but you got it every month. Once you had the people's money in, you you had a good life. Well, while the entirety of Wall Street's become assets under management. I left the business. I was a, I had, you know, my career was like an electrocardiogram. Um, I had really good years, and then I had, at the time, it doesn't compare anymore, but I, you know, all the titles, President Club, all those things. But then there was always that one clunker of a year, so that would keep you up at night, and you're like, oh God, what am I gonna do? But um, I was wrong. I left the business. I moved to London in uh, sometime in the mid '90s with with a friend of mine. We ended up being three or four guys to start a little boutique investment bank. And the basic concept was to raise money out of the Middle East for U.S. companies. And uh, uh, we raised. You know, it probably doesn't sound like a lot, but you know our pitch to people. We raised over $400 million. It's more now, but I, we don't have, we have a loose association now, not a not a formal one. And I wasn't part of every deal, so I'm, I'm not saying I personally raised all that. But, you know, for three guys and a phone, that was a pretty good job back in the late 90s, by the time we got to that number. Um, and I'll tell you about two of those companies in a second. But uh, um, my decision to leave was based, and I talked to my manager, a, good, a really good guy. I didn't know him that well. When I say my, I had flown back from London, and he was the manager of my office, which is now Morgan Stanley. And uh, all the same guys, and I would go visit. And I asked him, he's a tall guy, everybody's tall compared to me. but. I was amazed. I asked him, we were having a beer at the bottom line at the end, and I'm not good at talking about football or golf, so I talk about, you know, ideas. So I asked him, and I won't say his name just to protect him, but I asked him, uh, uh, 
how's it going to work? You know, we've had we've had a that office, the firm, was raising money and allowing brokers either to to manage money themselves or telling brokers to put money in in um, wrap funds, W R A P, wrap funds, and it's it's a way uh, wrapping people's assets with fees. So back then, it was one point for the the house. One point for the manager, call it Leon Cooperman, and one point for the broker. So three points came off the top per year out of the investor's account. And I said, how's that gonna work? I mean, if you have a good year, people won't notice it, but what if the, but what if the assets are only generating 7% or 5%? How are you gonna pay all those fees? And I'll forever admire him for his answer he says i don't think it's going to work i i don't see how it works and we discussed it and my opinion his opinion at the time which turned out to be wrong is they would first reduce the broker me my part then they would reduce the house's part and then finally they would re reduce the uh, third party manager well, from what I understand, it's the exact opposite. The third party managers have re reduced their fees when they have access to Morgan Stanley's clients. And uh, uh, the, the broker still gets, actually got more. I met one woman at, at a party, young, uh, a few years ago, uh, uh, who had been in the business for two years and she was grossing over a million a year. I said, how'd you do that? She said, well, because I said it took me a long time and I never, I actually never reached a million. Um, she said, well, I, you know, I charge everyone a wrap fee. Every single account she charged a wrap fee. I said, gosh, I, we couldn't do that. We would only be able to make money if we talked them into a mutual fund or in, into insurance or built a position in a stock. And uh, um, she said, well, you don't know how hard it is to manage people's money. This is just before the Fed launched us on a 10 year, 10 year bull market. So anyway, my point to you is that the, in, in the brokerage business where you bring your account, your account has to feed the broker and the house and the manager of funds, whether it's Leon Cooperman, uh, Michael Cohen, or uh, uh, Steve Cohen, sorry, or, uh, uh, you know, others. Um, then, then the, these big pools of money, they charge 20% of profits over maybe a uh, hurdle rate, maybe, not always. They charge 2% per year. And so they become billionaires, but they have to pay that. And then there's all the transaction costs. So, and maintaining the firm. So your little money has to maintain 3% at the brokerage firm. And then it's got to carry anywhere from 2% to as much as 20% in fees, maybe more, at the, at the funds. And then it's got to grease the wheels all the way around in the marketplace. When I got in the business, the, the financial portion of the Dow or the S&P, to my memory, was something like 3%. It was less than 5%. The market, the market was made of big indust, made up of big industrials, uh, uh, big names: IBM, Exxon, uh, digital equipment. You know those. I can't remember them all now. Those kind of names. And now I think the the percentage of the market for financial services is well over thirty five percent. It might be much higher. Well, that's a lot of mouths to feed, and everybody in it thinks because they went to MIT or Harvard or Yale or Princeton, they deserve to get paid. It's just like the lawyers. They think they deserve to get 1500 an hour without taking risk. 
It's just a deserve. Deserve's got nothing to do with it. Um, so my, my point to you, and I didn't promise you a rose garden, my point to you is that Wall Street's always about growth. It's massively about fees, con confusing the hell out of you, so you feel like you need them. Um, and, and you need lawyers, by the way. The system, you, I've, I just tried to do some things on my own. You do need lawyers, so. But um, I suggest to you that one answer to juicing revenues and gunning income and increasing fees and making sure that Jamie Dimon has a big salary, but all the national sales managers and regional sales managers have big, big salaries and big houses and drive nice cars. And then um, they can all go on trips to Florida or Bermuda and they can have, they can just enjoy life. Based on your little account, is by expanding assets under management. And I think that the Wall Street has, and with, with the DTCC, who's the Darth Vader of, of, and it's a private organization, I think it's owned by SED and co. Um, they, they custodial 95% or something of all the assets in the, in, in the markets. Um, and I, last I looked, it was 80 trillion. That's with a T, 80 trillion. Well, just for simplicity, just imagine if that's all in just one big hedge fund. It's not, but let's just say it is. Um, it gets 2% per annum for managing and then 20% of, of everything over, let's say 6% or 8%. Those are huge numbers. And um, uh, the question I have is, what if there's only really 60 trillion in real assets in there, not 80 trillion? The rest is all, the rest is all, or in the brokerage accounts, wherever it is, we don't know where it is, but it's all uh, inflated by the a concept that I call, I made, I made it up, of uh, fractional reserve uh, custodial ship or fractional reserve shareholding, holding, fractional reserve uh, shares in your accounts. Um, when I was a broker, you could you would open your account, and there would be a type one and a type two, and you would bring in a stock certificate, much like something like this. You bring it in, and I'd look at it, you'd sign it on the back, or I would have you sign a stock power in case you made a mistake. It was easier to change the stock power than the certificate. I'd bring it back to uh, uh, my operations manager, Pat. I'd say, Pat, it, could, I'm gonna deposit this. Uh, well, let me give it to uh, uh, Joan. Let her look at it, boom, okay, okay, boom, boom. It's in the account. Then we could sell it. Um, or you, we could, you could hold it in the account. Type one, it would be in your name. In this case, this is in my name. This is in my name. So if I said put it in type one, it would be in my name. The firm couldn't lend it out. Um, or if I put it in type two, it would be on margin. The firm could lend it out because it's part of the margin agreement. Well, now... Uh, several years ago from uh, Morgan Stanley, I got all my certificates sent back to me because they no longer hold anything in type one. And there were some really <laughs> shitty companies in there. So don't, don't think I'm a, I'm a uh, big shot. Um, so what they changed, that's one change they made. Another change they made you no longer can deposit these shares. All shares are electronic now. They're all electronic. There are no physical shares anymore. And I'll tell you a story about this in just a second. So everything's electronic, and so you just have to trust. 
So it's settlement, you have to pay your, that's the other thing, I could sell stock, you could call me up and say, Bill, I'm gonna send you 10,000 shares of uh, Verifone, I'd like to sell it. And if I had an account with you, and it had, it had a signature from the manager, I could sell it, pending delivery of those shares. Can't do that anymore, the shares have to be in the account. I could uh, take an order from you to go buy, um, you know, buy me 20,000 shares of Carrizo, I could buy it. But then in five days you had to wire the money or, or we would sell you out. Now the risk was if there's an error, it would come on me. So that was the, that was the valve that kept mistakes from happening. Can't do any of that, any of that anymore in retail. By the way, retail now is about 20% of the overall market. So anyway, I'll get off that point, but I just suggest to you that the system, quote unquote system, is, has developed into, throughout the system, everywhere, it's fractional. Um, what Merrill Lynch holds in, in uh, uh, Dole Foods, that was the example that Ham always puts up, is less than how many shares are actually out there. And this brings up all sorts of issues. How does the CEO sign off on it? How, on, on a, a statement, financial statements? Who's voting? Who controls the company? Who's electing the board? Who's authorizing new shares out? Phantom shares? So I think the whole system has become fractional reserve shareholding or fractional reserve custodial ship. I don't think there's any real shares in the sense that you can get something like this at home unless you pay a lot of money for it. For me to get this, to get a certificate out of an account will cost you $1,000. I'm going to tell you in a second about this one. I haven't been able to sell this <laughs> because to get it back into the system costs 2500 with one uh, I was going to say shyster, but I, that in this woke world, that has a meaning. I'm trying to think of another world. Anyway, this one firm out in California does this. They charge you 2500 takes 60 days. Then they, you have to pay a minimum commission, and they sell it for you. So it's a complete ripoff. But that's the only way to get this back into electronic form. I can't do it at the transfer agent. I can't do it at the company. And so the, the system is set up so that... Everything in the accounts is electronic, and to me, it's, it's, I don't want to say it's all fraud, but I would bet that there's not real shares in any one person's account. Everything's electronic, just like the banks. You remember that movie with, uh, uh, I told you that one before, but, uh, you know, you can just remember bank runs when people, you can re remember... Uh, before FDR put, created the FDIC, and it's happening in China right now. But people r all go to the bank at once. They want their money out. It's not all there. Well, that's the same thing with the stock market. And uh, uh, so getting back to the thugs surrounding your car and trying to pull your el elderly money mother out and maybe steal your Mercedes or steal your watch. They're all thugs. Just because it's a system doesn't make it legal. Just because it's organized doesn't mean it's not a crime. Look at the cocaine, the Medellin cartel. They make billions, but it's criminal. So going back to that, and what I've tried to do on these calls is try to focus just on GTII. But it is system-wide. We can get lost in fighting the whole system. And these guys have developed, these thugs have developed a way of distracting you by a lawyer joining in in the discussion. I'm not blaming anyone on ours. I'm sure that's not the case. But just like thugs surrounding the car, you have better not trust anyone. Don't trust anyone except someone you really know, family, uh, you know, lifelong friends, because you've got to get from your car in the middle of Manhattan to a safe place, and there's thugs all around. 
That's what's happening with your money in Wall Street. Thugs are everywhere. So anyway, why do I think you're lucky in GTII? You've got on the margin of all this criminality in Wall Street, you've got a couple of guys, three brothers named Kramer, and a lawyer in their house, and uh, uh, a, guy, a guy named Carlos Mayo, if that's a real name. Carlos Danger. I don't know if it's a real name, but it could be. Um, they may have six to eight investors behind them that have put 400 to 600 million in. Uh, that's all rumor. I, I, I don't, I, I share that. By the way, everything I say on this call that I've just said and I'm going to say is completely opinion. I think I have good sources. It's completely my opinion. Anything I say in terms of financial advice, you should ignore, do the opposite, or do nothing. I am not giving financial advice. So, uh, uh, we ha I'm not going to, you know, it's boring to keep running through it, but these guys are on the margin of all this criminality, and the, what they've gotten away with is toxic convertible debt. I believe the whole market, the over-the-counter market, is a, conv a toxic convertible note. Without the note, you don't need the note when you're when you're the big boys. But in this case, they're so small, they need the note as a backstop, and they're so untalented in terms of trading. They're very talented in terms of their crim criminal uh, uh, group, the RICO, racketeering. They're very talented in hiding who's doing the selling and all that. I've gone through why I believe it's them, because no one else would do this trade. So why you're lucky in this case is they don't know how to do anything else. Uh, the company paid off the note, and these guys just don't have anything else in their toolbox other than shorting the stock. They're trapped. And um, just like a pressure cooker or a beach ball that you're trying to hold down, um, and it pops up, they're, they're running out of, they're right at the end of their uh, tether. Now, if we want to slow it down and go higher in the attorney, cost you, the guy won't work for free, apparently, because it's, he's got a good heart, but he's not, he's not going to help us on contingency. So you got to come up with 25 grand. That'll be gone in about a month. And then you got to keep paying him or he stops. He'll make some filings and, and he won't ask for discovery because it, he might ask, but he'll never get to discovery. And then there'll be a settlement, which to him seems like a huge number because he's going through, I think it's called, in law, I think it's called equity. I'm not a lawyer, but he's, he's going through and he's going to go in front of the judge and he's going to say, and the judge is going to say, how much did your clients get harmed? And he's going to say, and the judge, and he's going to have to explain, prove why the stock is down because the Kramers were selling. Was it really down because, uh, um, you know, the, the piece of art that we bought didn't get delivered? And it's going to get all complicated. And so they'll settle. And it'll be a small number compared to what you want. Now, the way to really nail these sons of bitches, what really hurts these people. You can't hurt any of them. None of them. They, they don't care about you. They don't have feelings. They actually think you're subhuman. They think in their world that they somehow have the right to do this. Um, so don't, don't try to steal yourself from your good nature to be tough. You have to be tough. And the only way to make the Kramers hurt is get them in the pocketbook. It's like that thing, that meme you guys keep putting up on, uh, on, a lot of you do, from trading places. The only way they got the Duke brothers was to, to drive them into poverty. Uh, uh, take away their seat, sell everything. That's what, now they cheated, but we're, we're doing that, and that's the last reason you're lucky here, is you've got a guy named uh, Hamster, 
who's teaching you uh, every everything he knows from trading. I you know I worked on the wall on Wall Street. I would have killed to have access to my trading desks with the information that Hamster gives on every call at 3:40 every day. I mean, I would try, but these guys kept it zipped their little trading secrets. But you're getting that. And on top of that, you have a company that's fighting it. Um, and they're doing everything. Of course, you're all in a hurry. R r give, give us the count. Why? Because you're better than FINRA with what the count is? You know what to do with it? Oh, no, the, the journalists will write about it. There are no journalists anymore. There's a couple good ones, but journalists write about blood. If it bleeds, it leads. If there's a car accident, they write about it. If a plane crashes, they write about it. They don't write about a plane that was flying and it was, you know, there was a fuel leak or a car that the driver is drunk and if he keeps speeding, he's gonna have an accident. They, they, they write after the fact. So you're gonna get these articles from journalists after the squeeze in GTIR or another squeeze. Um, uh, so anyway, the way to get to the Kramers is a squeeze and it's like a pressure cooker or it's like that, that, that beach ball. If you want to let the air out of the beach ball by going to court, go ahead. If you, if you want to lift the top of the pressure cooker, let some of the steam out by going to a lawyer, go ahead. But, um, to go down that track will stall by time and that's what the Kramers want is time to work this out now the thing is the Kramers don't have time they don't have they don't have big funds helping them out they they can't they can't uh, uh, create synthetic shares buy a call sell a put and uh, buy a put I don't know how to how to do it myself they can't write a side letter that creates there are no shares available uh, from the company for the Kramers. So that all works to your advantage. And uh, you're in the, in the strong seat. So the way to hurt the Kramers is to allow the squeeze to happen. And what there's, I think our story break, breaks down to three things now, um, that, that in terms of a, of a trigger that might happen soon. And I think they're, they're worn out. I, I don't think they, they're trading like they don't have any money. Um, uh, yes, they've walked it down, but they've walked it down criminally, criminally. Less than 15 grand a day is real shares. The rest is just committing crimes with market makers and brokers and, and uh, 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 edging the stock down over the last six, six weeks. And the rest of us get all scared because we don't have, we can't break the law the way they do, and we don't have the lawyers, and we don't have a systematic mindset of, oh, short sellers are doing good, good work. They're cleansing the system from promoters and and shady CEOs, and uh, there's uh, there's a space for short sellers. Well, yeah, there is in a fair market. Every one of you knows how to play Monopoly by the rules, by the rules. Um, or, or, or risk or any of these or cards or poker everyone plays it by the rules but, but the markets they don't play by the rules you have to but they don't have to so anyway the way to get the Kramers is to have the squeeze and it's about to happen the three the three uh, triggers which is what I think we're down to one is when they when they finally cover their own real short account, whether it's in the name of Kurt Kramer, or it's in one of his LLCs, or if it's in his third brother's name, or if it's in a, in a friend's name in Panama, or if it's in a name of, of one of the guys he worked with all his life. That, um, Real, those real shares, those real short is going to be covered. They'll take the money out to pay Gibson Dunn, pay all the criminals, and then I believe they're going to stop. That means one of the triggers is a lessening in selling. Why do I say that? What's their incentive to keep selling? What's their incentive? Um, they've already hidden all the assets they can hid, hide. 
they've hired Gibson Dunn, so they've already put up probably half a million dollars up front. They need some money for them. But any money they sell in the fake accounts, the, the fake shares, they can't take out. They can't take out. So why would they keep doing it? Um, I just can't think of a reason. A margin call? No, they're going to walk away from these trades. They're going to walk away from these accounts. Uh, I think Gibson Dunn is trying to get a global settlement with the SEC. So why keep doing it? Now, one of the one side of uh, sign of desperation is that they've been doing everything in the open. It's so blatant that that a you know a, a first year SEC uh, hire could go in and ask for the sell tickets and go to each of the market makers and draw a cartoon up on a whiteboard for uh, Gary Gensler. Even Gary Gensler could understand it. I don't know why the more education people have, the, least, the less they're able to understand what's going on. It's, I guess it's because everyone is basically good people and they cannot believe that there's human beings that can be this evil and this thuggish. And they, they also, I was with a CEO of an oil company last week, two weeks ago. I might have already said this to you. He said, how do they, how do they let that happen, Bill? How do they let that happen? Exactly. Everyone thinks, how do they let it happen? All right, the second reason I think that, that the stock could go up very quickly is, I think FINRA is on this case. The count happened. FINRA is on the case. They're going to notify the market makers. I think the market makers will stop taking orders. Uh, because they've got other crimes to more profitable crimes to do and uh, uh, you know I, I think uh, uh, a knock on the door is as Gary always says is is gonna come and then all the selling becomes buying all the selling becomes buying um, I'm having a hard time thinking of my third reason maybe those are the only two um, <laughs> that's funny. Uh, I mean, I guess the only other, oh, I know what the third one was. It's just that one of, it's that whole, uh, Jeremy Irons thing. You know, you can, to make money in the market, you can either be smarter than everyone else is, uh, cheat, um, or be first, and I guess in the case of Citadel, they do all four. Well, I think there could be a buy-in by a margin clerk or someone that just says, you know, we want to get our money out because the rest of them are going to have to be in litigation forever. So I think we're nearly there. Um, I just want to tell you too, I know I didn't promise a short, short one. Um, a few years ago, I invested in this company, Dolly Varden Silver. I put $75,000 into it. I got 300,000 shares. And to my memory, I, I, didn't, I didn't take the time to calculate it before I got on this call. But I, I think my memory is really good because I studied it a lot. That 30, 300,000 shares, uh, almost, it was 2009, I think. So... 12 years ago. This is a very good company. It's, a, it's one of the few public silver companies in the world. It's in the Golden Triangle in Canada. Um, Eric Sprott is an investor. It's surrounded by Newmont Mining. It once was the largest silver mine in the British Empire, and it's got reserves. So at the time I invested, uh, I was excited to be in it. I had on paper 120,000 ounces of silver, 120 ounces, 1,000, 120,000 ounces of silver for my 300,000 shares. Well, um, guess what? I didn't know about all this short selling. I, I, had a, I had certain inklings on the margin, but I didn't know about the pervas pervasiveness of it. This stock now gets about 40 to 60, sometimes 70% of its shares fail to deliver in the open market. And I'm trying, they have a new CEO who's very nice and he's doing a good job. Um, and they've added reserves, they've, they've built out their camp. It's a really good stock. 
but my my 300,000 shares, I don't have the other certificate because I'm sending it to that guy <laughs> to try to get it back in the system, became 30,000 shares. They had a 10 for one split, or I should say it the other way around, one for 10s, they had a reverse split. And then they've raised money and it's been shorted into oblivion. But now, the thing I wanna tell you, um, they have 200, basically 250 million shares outstanding. They basically have 35 million ounces of silver in the, Canada has a different term. It's called, I think, predictive. Anyway, let me use proven. They have uh, 335 million ounces of silver proven. So based on my ownership position, <laughs> my ownership of this company that's doing great and has only grown reserves and it's only the story is only getting better because of short selling i now have paper four thousand ounces of proven silver instead of 120,000 ounces there was a company called uh, acre biosciences that when we were in london i brought we raised um to my memory, four to six million dollars uh, for the company. We didn't do any of the tricks the rest of these guys do. We didn't know how to do it. So after about three years of work, a lot of work, we settled. We didn't get cash. We got, because we always operated on the idea that our investors should get their money back first. We got um, warrants. And I think we each got 400,000 warrants but we didn't know how to sell against them. We didn't have a market maker. We didn't do any of that. But they ended up coming with a, um, I think it was Case, KBC Peel Hunt. I think it was somebody was going to raise money for them out of the UK. And um, so we we they wanted to make a deal with us. So we each I ended up getting each of us. I got 150,000 shares, which were trading at a pound, uh, a pound 20 or a pound something, pound 50. Um, and I think they might have been as high as $3. Anyway, it doesn't matter. This is a rapid diagnostic testing uh, company. Brilliant technology, FDA approvals, uh, a lot of growth, um, you know, for blood testing for, I'm sure they, they probably now have one for COVID. Um, they, they uh, I'm trying to remember the other ones, but they, they had the AIDS test. You know, you could basically have it beside your bed if, if you got lucky, not, you know, I'm talking about you guys, not me. Um, uh, anyway, it was a great, and it's been a growing, growing company. It's still in existence, raised a lot of money. Well, guess what? My 150,000 shares is now eight shares, eight shares. I think the stock trades for four dollars, so I never sold. And my, I, this is what short selling is doing to the marketplace. It's it's just horrible, thuggish crime. And so to be polite to these people, um, I think it's a mistake. And my alarm bells are up on it for a couple of the people on Twitter as being uh, shills for the Kramers. And I'm not going to go so far that my alarm bells were up for the lawyer, but I will say when he represented Venu, um, what I just described to you came to pass. He had a he had a great success at getting uh, Venu's uh, lenders power up lending uh, violated out of New York for usury laws. Well, I looked it up and you can look it up. They're in the middle of an offering right now with another group. It sounds just like the Kramers. I forget the guy's name. I think he's in Nevada or somewhere and with an office in New York. Same kind of low life, I'm sure. I don't know him. But they are doing, they've designed an offering. They've expanded the amount of shares to four billion. And they've designed an offering where they do 80% of the VWAP of the trades for like the 10 previous trading days, but the company gets to put the shares 
two, uh, two, I wanted to say the Kramers, it's not the Kramers, but to this financial group. Now it's, it, it reads like it's selling pre-existing shares and it's just accommodating a uh, existing shareholder. But I'll tell you, I didn't study it. I, it just makes my eyes glaze over and I don't want to get distracted. But for all the world, it looks to me like a workaround on the usury laws, changing uh, the design as clever lawyers can do uh, to get around the rules. And uh, so I won't pick on, on the lawyer that's there. I just caution you. The other thing I'll caution you about going the legal route, when you open an account at a brokerage firm, you sign a arbitration clause. So most of the things that you're upset with your broker or even your prime broker, they don't even go to court. They go, they go to arbitration. I once had to go through it, which I won hands down. My, my, anyway, it's a different story, but I, I really opened my eyes. You go before, I had to fly out to LA and you sit there and it's just, it's, it's retired industry types and uh, they have the power to make the decision. So there's no lawyer that's, most of the arguments you have, but there's no lawyer gonna take it because they're not gonna win. It's, it's before an arbitration panel of industry professionals. What are the odds? Um, okay. I'm just, I, I wanted to say some more things, but I, I wanna finish on one idea for you guys. When you invested in this stock, maybe you did it quickly, maybe it was in the middle of uh, the flush of excitement of AMC and, and GME, and you heard it was gonna squeeze and, and Hamster had called the other one. Well, in many ways, um, this, trade is a, I don't want to say a failed trade, but it hasn't worked. Um, now, to Megan Dunn on the, on the Twitter, she had an opportunity to sell her shares at $2 more than once. So it has worked if you're a trader, but in the sense that a lot of us got in it, I have a small amount, um, uh, we, we were hoping for this huge, uh, you know, rocket ship to go up with, you know, basically with a short squeeze. Well, in that sense, it hasn't happened. And now we're all, we're all kind of doubting it. Uh, which is, you know, which is what the Kramers count on. And that's the FUD that that lawyer uh, talks about. Um, but what I want to tell you is you have to take time to think about why you got in the trade. Um, Hamster said this on a call. I've, I've always said it to investors. We were trained that way. If you get into an investment, if nothing's really changed, and in this case, the story's gotten even better. By the way, I remember the third thing is fundamentals. There might be one or two fundamental stories that could come through right now that might surprise you, uh, particularly with 1-800-LAWYERS. Uh, of course, they're probably arguing about the price because the Kramers have driven down the price. So how many shares should it be? 100 million or 140 million? I have no idea. You know, that's the damage that short selling does. Because we all look at stock price and, and it's like in the oil market, we value the entire uh, complex of oil based on the last marginal trade. It's really a silly way to value something particularly when the marketplace is manipulated. But anyway, uh, uh, in this case, you got in for certain reasons and they've only gotten better. So unless you need the money because you had a heart attack or you're getting married or, you know, you wanna, you know, move to Tahiti, there's no real reason to get out of this stock. So there's two reasons to get out. One is if, the stories change to the negative, then you should get out. And maybe in your case, that's, that's how it is. 
The second reason to get out is if there's a better investment, if there's something else out there that is a better idea or a better situation. And um, that's only you can decide that. I think about it all the time. You could go to Redbox. Um, uh, I bought 200 shares of Redbox at like seven and sold it at four. So uh, that didn't work. You could go to um, uh, AMC or GME and just hope you catch one of the waves up, but they always drive it back down. Um, you know, there's, a, there's, a, there's, there's about 20 or 30 examples of short squeezes over the last two years. Hopefully you get in just before the wave goes up, but, but before it crashes down. But I don't know of another story where you have as much detailed information. You have a short trapped, acting trapped, and all the reasons I've given before. And uh, they can't use any tricks to get out of it. So I'm not sure there's a better short story. There might be a better long-term investment, an ETF or a, you know, an income fund, or maybe cash is better for you, but that's, that's up to you. Um, but the, uh, the thing I'll leave you on now that it's approaching in an hour, and I should have started with this, I'm getting bitten by mosquitoes, is when you get in investments, I think you have to have an overall theme of what you're trying to do and why you're in it. And I'm gonna suggest one to you. But that, that gives you strength against doubt and it gives you strength against uh, cheaters. And I think the theme that you have to be in now in your lives, I'm older than most of you, the world is changing. It's changing so rapidly, you know, COVID lit the match, but uh, populations are on the move. Uh, I study oil and gas, and I'll tell you, we've consumed over probably 60% of the world's endowment, uh, at least of easily accessible oil. Um, gas, I don't know the exact numbers because gas, you have to count in, you know, there's, there's frozen gas in the tundra of Siberia. There's there's uh, what they call methane in the, in the UK, methane um, deposits. There's a term for it, I'm skipping, but they're in the deep seas along the coastlines. So there's a lot of potential um, gas, but in, in terms of oil, we've burned the, we, we've had the holiday, we've had the party, and from now on, I'll give you an example uh, Sa Saudi Arabia basically says they can prov produce 11 to 12 million barrels a day. I don't think they have done that in a long, long time. The Garwar field was discovered um, before the Beatles became popular. It was discovered before, maybe even b before the birth control pill came out. Um, I think it was discovered in the late 40s, and I think it was first uh, drilled in the in the late 50s. I, you know, I could be wrong, but it's a long, long time ago. And all fields decline, and and what they there's a zone in there called the Special K, and to my memory, it's been a while since I I read it. There's a book by uh, Matthew Simmons. I highly recommend. He wrote it 15 years ago, so he, he was wrong. It's called Twilight in the Desert. It's a scary, scary book. But the Special K produces the majority of the oil out of the Garwar field, the King of Kings field. But they flood it with seawater to get the, in a very sophisticated process to flush the oil out. Well, at any time that could water out and then you're gonna get an announcement from the Saudis that they're gonna save the rest of the oil for future generations or for internal consumption. But that could literally happen at any time. Um, ignoring that, the decline of Saudi oil fields is 5% a year. So if they produce 10 million ounces, uh, barrels a day, 
that's 500,000 barrels a day that is lost every year. So you have to keep drilling just to keep and then keep it uh, even. And this goes on worldwide on, on just a hamster-like spinning wheel. Well, anyway, I think for your younger people, you're going to face a time when energy is far more expensive. Uh, you're going to have to live where you want to live. Travel isn't going to be for the masses. It'll be for the asses, uh, you know, the rich people. Uh, you're going to need to live near water where transportation is by boat. Uh, you're going to have to live near rail where tra where you can transfer, you can... Uh, uh, transport goods and services much less expensively than on highways but it, but it's not just oil it's all sorts of other uh, assets water is, clean water is going to be difficult so um, what I think the theme you should be going through with GTII is that you should be treating GTII not as a stock and not as dollars you should not be measuring your return in how rich you're going to be gtii is a vehicle and the dollars you sell it for are a vehicle so that you can go buy the home of your dreams with, with marry the person you want have the family that you want maybe buy a farm make sure it's near water and a rail and a rail system uh, maybe move to a different country, uh, but you should be thinking in terms of what are the, mat the materials, the wrong word, material things that, you know, the, the things you can knock and touch and shut the door on and take a bath in and grow food in and, and sit around and, and uh, read a book, have a fire, have your friends over, be near a hospital, but you should be seeing this GTII as an opportunity to change your financial world. Now, if it's stressing you, you should reduce your position. But at some point, there's a really good chance, and there's still risk. And I, I would suggest to you that the, ris the risk that you're paying for, right now it's 60 cents to the downside. Maybe you bought in a little higher, but the risk you're paying for is time and all this frustration. And that's why I give these videos to the 10 people that watch them. Um, uh, try to get, you're paying and you deserve the reward you get because you're hanging in there, but you're paying for it in opportunity cost and time. But um, yeah, that's what I want to say. I think if you, I don't know how much you have, but you have a thousand shares or 10,000 shares. Let's say you have 10,000 shares and it goes to 10 bucks. You have $100,000, but let's say it goes to 100 bucks. You have a million dollars. Let's say it goes to my favorite number, 500, but I actually think it might be headed to much higher. Let's say it goes to 600. Well, let's just say you end up with a million or $2 million. You can, what you're hanging on for isn't the angst of, oh God, I'm losing money. Oh my God, my account's down. What you're trying to do, and you may fail. I'm not saying you're, I'm not saying you're win, going to win, but this is your home run swing. This is your grand slam swing. What you're trying to do is create for you, your family, and your grandchildren uh, a home somewhere, you know, where your father can be and the hills overlooking LA uh, with three garages and a, a guest room for for when your daughter comes back from school and then with you know maybe maybe a pool and maybe in the future when she has children it's where the grandchildren come and if life gets difficult it's in a it's an area that the whole family can live um, you know with dogs and and uh, uh, maybe a bodyguard and you can be safe there's going to be a panic in the financial system there's going to be a panic in the energy system and it's going to start with the bond market the bond market has uh, something like and you know hamsters already saying oh god this is so long 
let's 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 uh, watch the football game. Um, it's there's 300 trillion in in global debt. That's more than a quarter quadrillion, and uh, and it's growing. Well, it's all predicated. If if you go back to and I'll tie it up with this, the fractional reserve banking system. Um, growth, the idea of growth. It, growth used to start in Holland. It was the windmill. So it started with the windmill. And uh, in, in Portugal, I mean, it's no, uh, no accident that it was the Dutch, the Portuguese, even the Spaniards, and the English that had empires around the world because they turned their forests their big trees into wind. That was the first energy that started changing uh, human beings' lives. And in England, they started the modern uh, industrial system with the mills. So water would, would turn the mills and uh, they conquered the world uh, with these big sail ships. So they became an empire, but then they found coal and coal is what uh, continued the British Empire uh, when Winston Churchill first came in. But, but Winston Churchill, and there's a big dynamic with, with uh, the king of Saudi Arabia and Roosevelt, but World War I, II, and even one, but World War II was, was won on the oil from Texas. And, and uh, Churchill moved ships from coal to oil and uh, the United States empire has totally floated on oil, inexpensive oil. And at, at the height of our production, which has been surpassed recently, but when you look at energy in, energy out, it was when Elvis Presley was king. We're, we've had a little bit of a re renaissance, but a lot of it's attributable to free money and uh, uh, drilling horizontal wells that give you four to one on on your energy in energy out instead of 20 or a hundred to one but anyway um, uh, for going back to fractional reserve banking this this modern industrial sim system was built on growth and built on cheap energy that ever grew so unless we come up with the next uh, energy system and there may be one out there it, you know, it may be the fourth generation nuclear power. It may be, uh, you know, something we don't know about. I've always wondered uh, what, what energy that civilization used before Noah's flood or, the, the, you know, the pre-flood myths. Because they didn't use the oil and gas or coal. So maybe there was an energy back there. But for now, we don't know what the next energy system is. And the fact is energy is going to get expensive. Oil, I once asked Matthew Simmons, uh, a great guy, died at 63. He was an investment banker. He's one of those men who gave you full attention when you talk to him. Uh, but I once asked him, well, when's oil going to go to $150? He said, a barrel. He said, I, I didn't say, I said it's going to go to three figures. I didn't say 150. It's going to go to five or six hundred dollars a barrel. So imagine your life, imagine your life when gasoline costs thirty dollars a gallon. Imagine your grocery stores when the truckers don't have enough money to go. I'm just telling you life is going to be different so think it out. What's going to happen, though, is these overpaid wankers, they all went to two schools and all think they're smarter than you are, have all invested in debt and all have invested in these strategies of, of uh, I, I can't even say them all, alpha, beta, uh, gamma, and we're going to hedge that and we'll have the growth here. And it's all gobbledygook. It's, it, it, your common sense is better than what, they, what they're doing. But when they wake up one morning and say, what happened with fractional reserve banking? They could lend out uh, $1,000 on $100 in reserve at 7%. Why? Because the economy was growing. So they figured if, 
if six out of those loans paid off, they could afford one loan that went bad. And uh, this idea of fractional reserve banking led to a debt-based society. So our whole society is based on credit cards creating money for you out of thin air, but they do it on a law of nar large number scale. And so if they lend out a thousand dollars to a hundred thousand people, as long as 80,000 of them pay back, they can take the loss on 10 or 20,000 people. Why? Because the whole economy is growing, there's jobs, and not everybody's gonna fail. Well, what's gonna happen with these overpaid wankers when oil is as expensive as I describe, and I don't know when, but it could, it could happen this year, it could take 10 years. But when it happens, the debt can't be paid back and growth, this idea of growth is going to disappear. So, which will be fine. Life will be fine. Man, it'll be great. Imagine living and enjoying how the birds sound and the deer that come up to your garden and, and uh, you know, going down to the town square and listening to music and, you know, somebody brews beer in their basement and uh, you grind coffee. I mean, it, it can be a wonderful life. But before it gets to that new world, there's going to be a panic. There's going to be a financial panic that you just will not. It's going to be like a hurricane. And so what you need to do is survive it. And, you know, you know this spoofing and, and, and uh, parking trades and swapping trades, you think it's going on in GTII. It's going on in the precious metals markets, it's going on in the oil markets, the gold markets, treasury markets. They're cheating everywhere because for some reason they deserve to. But when it crashes, the panic is going to be frightening. And, and I'm not sure, one of the reasons I chose to live where I live is because I'm near the White House and maybe there'll be military around. But imagine the suburbs when gasoline is so expensive and people can't drive in, the, su the suburbs are going to become like the slums. Imagine the suburbs when all the men that play football on Friday nights or Saturday nights suddenly don't have a way to go play football and they get bored and they don't have a job and they're roaming around. And these are men of all shapes and sizes, but they're bigger than I am. What happens? All of our houses have glass windows and glass doors. What happens? The panic is going to be fucking frightening. So what you can do against it is think of, and the dollar will go away. We don't know what will come back in, in, in its stead. But, but look, the United States is a great country. We have great ideals as long as we keep uh, our ideals of freedom and individual rights. We have a huge, bountiful uh, continent. So I'm not, I'm not negative in the long run, but you've got to get through the hurricane to the other side. You've got to get through the hurricane to the eye in the middle of the hurricane and then through the hurricane again, and you've got to survive to the other side. How do you do that? Real assets. The other place you do it is being living someplace safe and secure. Get to know your neighbors. Know your friends so that you, that you each have each other's back. Buy gold, buy silver, buy, you know, have um, uh, small bits of cash and coins uh, at your home. Have food store, you know, all these things. It's, it makes me sound like a kook, but be able to survive the panic because the one thing about panic, it runs out of energy. There's no, people will panic and they'll riot and grab, but then they run out of energy and they just accept the new situation. I want you guys to survive the, into the new situation. I want you to be the middle class, the upper middle class and the wealthy. So what I want you to see GTII as is one of your bets on making enough cash that you can turn into a farm, you can turn into a homestead, you could turn into a boat, you could turn into uh, owning a property on an island somewhere, owning two properties. Um, 
you could turn into having more than one passport. But I think you have to look at GTII as something bigger than one frustrating trade with a bunch of thugs. Don't let them take it away from you. This, this potentially has more impact on your children's lives than whether or not these criminals um, con you for another two or three months. The squeeze is gonna come. If you have a thousand shares, it goes to a hundred dollars. Um, I think that's a million dollars. A million dollars, you sell it, pay your taxes, and go buy a farm in uh, South America. Go, go to uh, uh, Italy. Go to go to Wyoming. Go go to, you know, upstate New York is beautiful. It's where I'm from. I never lived there, but Vermont, New Hampshire, upstate New York. Um, the pr prices are depressed. Well, guess what's there? Niagara Falls. So there's electricity. There will be a there will be power generation. There's there's canals that they could reopen. There's uh, rails, and there's rivers, and it's green and it's lush, and you can live there and have a good have a good life. But think like that. Where where if you get stuck living, could you live for the next 10, 20, 30 years? You're going to want to travel a little bit, but it might have to be by rail or, or boat. Um, so I guess what I'm saying is if you can see GTI as a theme, as one of the many um, strategies, several, that you might be pursuing to, to become a strong financial independent entity, that doesn't have to take shit from no one. I think it'll allow you to withstand and ignore some of the buffers and shit that the Kramers try to pull off. This isn't one crook. This is a well-oiled team of probably about 20 different people, including lawyers, and you don't know which lawyer's on their side. You don't know which person on Twitter is on their side. You just don't know. So, so that's what I'm saying. Guard this investment as if you were guarding uh, your children's future. I'm not guaranteeing it's gonna work out, but you've got everything lined up that it could. And I don't, in my lifetime of, of investments, and I've lost a lot of money, um, I don't see a lot of things that line up like GTII. Okay, I'm going to stop, and I, I hope you fell asleep by now. So anyway, uh, have a good night. Um, I hope Juan Sto Soto stays with the Nationals, and uh, I wish you the best. Cheers.